What is going on, students? Happy Tuesday. It is April already. April 7th, to be exact. And, uh, yeah, I'm missing you guys. I'm missing getting together. I'm missing talking about the word. I'm missing being in community, actually, physically. <laughs> I know you guys are, too. I'm preaching in the choir there, but, um. Nonetheless, we've got an awesome uh, section of scripture to work through, and uh, I pray God uses it. I pray that you guys are encouraged, and we're going to actually talk about God's sovereign orchestra, and how He sovereignly orchestrates things in, um, in the life of Paul, but we also know this is true in our lives also, and in this time of being on lockdown... Or house arrest. Uh, he's orchestrating things. And he's ultimately working for his glory and our good. Um, so let's just open up in some prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you. God, as we... Uh, as we're close uh, physically and um, with time with our families... And in our homes and with each other, God, we pray that you would give us a thirst for your word and a thirst for you and that we would commune with you, that we would come to you, that we would run to you in these times of frustration, in these times of anger, or disappointment or depression and um, these emotions that are just building inside of us and then maybe erupting and then building some more and erupting again. And as we see that uh, this is going to continue into the early parts of May, as of now, we pray that your peace would shower over us in this time. God, we pray that your word would speak to your children through this message and that um, it would be your words, God, not mine. And uh, we would learn as we hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys for tuning in and watching this. And grab your notebooks, grab your Bibles for sure. Um, actually, I'm not going to say Bibles for sure. Grab your notebooks and your Bibles and a pen. We're going to work through um, the tail end of Acts. We're going to start, excuse me. We're going to start in Acts 21, and we're going to end up in Acts 28. Um, and I want to encourage you guys again, like last week, I want you to uh, I want you to read this throughout your week. I want you to kind of unpack this more with your own time with God and your own time in His Word as this week goes on. I hope you did that with last week's devotional with the Old Testament, and I hope that you will do that with this week's. So let's dive in. Again, we're talking about God's sovereign orchestra and we're starting in Acts 21. We're going to start with verse 27. So Paul has been, I'll just give you a little recap here. Paul has been preaching to the Gentiles um, all over the place and God's brought many people to saving faith in him and God. And now he's coming back to Jerusalem and he meets up with his buddies with James and some of the elders of the of the Christian church and he's like hey guys how's it going he tells them everything that God has done and they're just celebrating and they're worshiping God and then um, they tell him about how some of the Jews in the area are upset because they're hearing some of his teachings as far as they feel like he's teaching to neglect the law of Moses to not circumcise and all these things and he in a way, is, but he's not teaching to neglect that. Rather, he's teaching that the Messiah has come. And this Messiah was Jesus Christ and is Jesus Christ. And so they have this plan for him to um, be included in or partake in this vow, which is kind of like a kind of like a fast, but it's um, where you'll abstain from things that make you unclean as far as the Jewish law or... Um, 
would would dictate you being unclean. So he abstained from probably drinks, alcohol drinks, and touching dead bodies, which I don't know how often he did that anyways, but, um, and he probably didn't cut his hair till maybe this vow was 30 days or so. Anyways, he's included in this vow, and um, they end up, some Jews from Asia end up seeing him, and all these rumors and angry people had um, hated on him. So these Jews from Asia are coming to, well, we'll see what happens. Here we go. Verse 27. Acts chapter 21, verse 27. If you haven't got your Bible yet, you can actually pause this and go get your Bible and a notepad and a pen. We'll wait while we're on pause. I'm not going to wait while we're doing this, but we'll wait while we're on pause. All right. Acts 21, 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jew. Okay, I guess it was a seven day vow. Okay. Um, when the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple. And has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul brought him into the temple. He didn't, but they thought that he did. They assumed. Verse 30. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune, of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. So the the tribune is like a uh, like a commander, like a commanding officer. <clears throat> he at verse thirty two. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when he saw the tribune, when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So Paul's getting beat, and then all of a sudden, oh oh, here comes the troops. Okay, let's stop beating him. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he, as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried. So they actually carried Paul. He was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him! Away with him. So Paul's arrested. Obviously, this crowd of Jewish people is pretty violent. And I don't know what would happen if the Tribune guy didn't show up with the soldiers. They might have killed Paul. I don't know. Nonetheless, they showed up. And there's a little piece of the beginning of God's sovereignty that we're going to see in this text. So, soldiers show up. They arrest him. And now they bring him into the barracks, into the soldiers' quarters okay now verse 37 as paul was about to be brought into the barracks he said to the tribune may i say something to you and he said do you know greek are you not the egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the four thousand men of the assassins out into the wilderness no that's not who paul is verse 39 paul replied i am a jew from tarsus and cilicia a citizen of no obscure city he's kind of hinting at rome there I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And we had given him permission, Paul standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And there was a great hush. So these people that were just in a riot now has become a great hush. In the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. So he's arrested. They're bringing him in the barracks. He's like, hold on, can I say something? And he goes, like, aren't you the dude that let out these assassins? He's like, no, I'm Paul of Tarsus. Anyways. He's like, all right, you can speak. So he starts into this, uh, really his testimony. And I want you guys to pay attention to this here. We're not going to read it all the way through, but we're going to start at part of it. Um, again, I encourage you to read through it later. All right. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense I now make before you. And when they had heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia but brought up in this city, excuse me, educated 
at the feet of Gamaliel. Now, Gamaliel is um, was one of the greatest Jewish teachers of his day. He's known um, for his interpretations of the law, and he actually intervened on behalf of Peter and the apostles back in earlier in Acts. As a young as a young man, the apostle Paul was a taught by him and he was uh he learned the law of moses from gamaliel and he was apparently a really good student so that's a little bit of who gamaliel is according to the strict manner of uh, sorry verse two verse three middle of it okay there's gamaliel according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers being zealous for god as all of you are to this day so he's like hey i'm i was with i was just like you guys I was zealous for God as all of you are right now. All this passion that's coming out of these Jews seems to be zeal or passion for God. Okay? Now, verse 4. I persecuted this way. He's hinting at Christianity there. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. So these people know know who he was, right? Know who he is. Halfway through verse 5, And I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. I'm heading over to Damascus to rip people out of their homes, rip fathers and mothers away from their children, and take them to Jerusalem to punish them. Verse 6, I was As I was on my way, and drew near to Damascus. Again, this is Paul talking about his testimony. About noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. Now, mind you, Paul's speaking to these Jews, right? That are all super mad at him. They want to kill him. All right? So he says, you'll be, It'll be appointed for you what to do. Verse 11, And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, since he was blinded, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received my sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And what's Paul doing right now? He's witnessing to everything he's seen and heard, right? And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. And I saw him, again, Jesus, saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. So what he's kind of saying is, Lord, they know that I was on their side of this, right? They know that I was zealous for you, for God, okay? And when the blood, verse 20, and when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. This is what he's saying to Jesus, right? And he said to me, Jesus said to him, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Now look at what happens here. Up to this word they listened to him. Verse 22, Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So now he's like, All right, that's enough. We're going into the barracks. So they listened to him up until this one point. Right? Sorry, my phone wasn't on by rate. Um, They listened to him up until this one point. Now, it seems... um, It seems either they were upset that he uh, was was saying was painting Stephen, whom they all killed, as to be a witness of Jesus. When when he says in verse uh, 
19. No, I'm sorry, 20. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments. Now he's talking about Jesus Christ, whom they, the Jews crucified, right? And now he's talking about Stephen, whom was a witness to Jesus Christ, who is God. Then he says, God told me to bring this news to the Gentiles. Then they were mad, right? So there's some underlying things here, but I think it's a lot about this racism, um, this hate that the Jews had for the Gentiles, okay? Now, they finally say, that's enough. We're not hearing from you anymore. Um, and Paul, And then in chapter 23, this continues. Chapter 23, Paul goes before the council. And there's an uproar about the resurrection of the dead between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it ends up more than 40 Jews make a pact and they're going to try to kill him. Okay? They're like, we're not going to eat until we kill Paul. So then Paul comes before the governor Felix, who's a Roman governor of Judea at that time. And verse, in chapter 24, 14 through 16. Again, read. you can even pause this and read between these and see, see what happens. All right, we're going to jump to 24, 14 through 16. And it says this, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers. So now he has the ear of the governor. And what's he do? He, he starts right in to talking about the God of, of the Jewish forefathers of the world, right? The only true God. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God which these men themselves accept. They accept that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. So as he goes around preaching the gospel, he preaches to whoever God brings him to in order to have a clear conscience. So he's not convicted of maybe this racism st stuff that's going on. Who knows what else? But he always tries to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, after several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to bring, present offerings. So he goes into now what happened and why these people are so worked up at him. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. So Paul, he, he drops this eternity bomb in uh, chap in verse 15 he talks about the resurrection of both the just and the unjust so he drops that bomb on him right and then he goes on to present the situation the governor Felix later on the governor Felix and his wife would actually come to Paul and talk with him while he's in prison so this this went on and um, two years later Paul gets left in prison as the governor Felix is replaced by Portius Festus so he gets replaced. Paul's still in prison. Now, I don't know how many... The Bible talks about one time in the tail end of chapter 24 when Felix and his wife came and, and talked to Paul. Paul presented the gospel to them. So he's just constantly presenting the gospel to whoever God brings to hear. I don't know how many times they came back, but it says that Paul would... Uh, that he sent him away till later. So, well, if Paul, go away. I'll hear you later on it. So however many times Felix and his wife did that, I don't know. So Paul's in prison for two years, and he's Felix the governor is replaced by a new governor. And look at how the Jews still hate him. More than two years later, they're still trying to kill him. Look at chapter 25. Now three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Darn it. Caesarea. I don't know how to say that one. Anyways. And the chief priest and the principal men. I wish I could. By the way, I wish I could pr figure out how to pronounce this and rewind this video. But I don't know how to do that. I have to record all of this 19 minutes. So I'm not going to do that. I think it's Caesarea. Darn it. Caesarea. That's it. Caesarea. I'm rolling with that. Verse 2. And the chief priest and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul. And they urged him. Asking a favor against Paul. That he summoned him to Jerusalem because they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. So now, two years later, they're like, hey, this guy sucks. He uh, causes riots, whatever. They're making up these lies. And they're trying to get him 
to release him to go to Jerusalem so they can kill him. All right. Paul ends up appealing to Caesar since he's a Roman citizen. Festus agrees to send him to Caesar. But before that, King Agrippa comes. And King Agrippa is um, Herod the Great's great-grandson. So Herod the Great, if you remember, was king when Jesus was born. And that's when he ordered all the firstborn or the boys three and under to be killed. Right? <clears throat> so that was Herod the Great. So now this is his, gra- his great-grandson. Not a great family line, okay? Um, then in 26, 12 through 32, let's see what happens here as King Agrippa hears Paul. 26, verse 12. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus. Here goes Paul again, right? He's going to share his testimony with him, and he does. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, verse 13, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we have all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Again, he goes into Jesus appeared to me and he presents his testimony to him. I won't read all of that. Um, I want to jump over to verse 20. But declare, but I declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. So he goes through his testimony and says, And then I went and preached repentance to these people. Then they tried to kill me. Verse 22. To this day I've had the help that comes from God. Mind you, he's again preaching to the governor and now this king. I've had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. I said nothing but what the word of God said would come. That the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Now, the king goes in and goes, he goes in, or Festus goes in and saying, would you actually try to persuade me to believe the things that you're saying right now? Would you, would you actually persuade me to believe? And Paul says, uh, I'm sorry. Festus says, you're out of your mind. Paul's like, no, I'm speaking rational words. Then King Agrippa says, are you, are you trying to convince me to become a Christian in this short of time? And Paul says, I want to convince anyone and everyone I talk to to be like me, except for these chains. And he's saying, except for being a prisoner. So read, catch up on that. So then he presents the gospel again and his testimony. I don't want you to look at how he lays it out in front of this royal audience. Whoever is there, I'm sure it's not a small get together. And he makes a point to let them know in verse 22 that to this day he has had the help. That comes from God. Look at how God continues in this seemingly horrible situation that no one wants to be in. Even Paul says, I wish that you would be like me except for these chains. I don't want you to be a prisoner because this sucks. But look at how God is continuing to bring forth his word through Paul to these people. And it's no accident that the king Agrippa just happened to come hang out with Festus, and then Festus is like, hey, come check out this prisoner. You should hear from him. And the gospel gets presented again. So they end up saying, well, he's we can't com- we can't convict him of anything as far as crimes. He wants to appeal to Caesar. We'll send him to Caesar. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they end up sending him to Caesar. Now, um, this is not a small trip for Paul to take. And in verse... Um, 27 Paul starts for Rome and I have this map that I was going to I was going to read through their journey but it appears that is going to take too much time but I want you to look at this map and I'll just kind of read it through you to you oh man this is going to be tricky I don't know how I'm going to read this well he starts <laughs> this isn't going to work darn it okay take a picture of this map and then when you go back through go ahead get your phone out or take a screenshot of this map and when you go back through chapter 26, no, chapter 27, you can read about this trip and how amazing it was. Maybe that's a better picture. There you go. How amazing it was how how God started Paul. Was it this side? Yeah. From all the way over here, they end up getting stopped here. And, and he tells them not to sail across this section of sea because it's the winter. And it's going to be a wreck. And they end up doing it anyways. But God brings them to this little tiny island right here. And I want to read to you about what happens in this island. Called Malta. Okay. 
Now, they end up they end up 14 days being blown and tossed by the wind. The ship ends up breaking apart, but thank God they run it up upon shore. And a lot happens between that. There's like 276 people on this ship. None of them die. And Paul said none of them would die as long as they got rid of the lifeboat and they just stayed on the ship. So they did. Everybody survived and they end up running ashore on this island of Malta. They, they swim a little ways to get to the actual shore. Um, now, look what God does. After verse chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people... On this map, you can't even see... I mean, the island's like tiny. I'm going to show you again. Here's Malta. All right? It's like super tiny. Wish I had a color printer. But it's really small right there. Okay? God brings them there. Uh, the whole area of that sea, that's where they end up shipwrecked. Okay? Chapter 28. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness for the kindled a fire and welcomed us all. Remember, there's 276 of them. They welcomed us all because it begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on him. I'm not sure if that means bit him. I'm kind of thinking it means it bit him. Um, because how else would a snake fasten on you? I don't know. Anyways, fastened on him, on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, again, it sounds like he's like, what? The thing's hanging on him, right? They said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Now, they could be speaking of literally just the ethic of justice, or they could be talking about this other false goddess thing. Justice has not allowed him to live. Verse 5, he, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Small g, God. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Pub Publi... Ah, oh, nuts. Publius. We're going to call him Publius. Publius. <laughs> All right. Who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly, and when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. Now, it doesn't say this in those scriptures, but I have a hard time believing that Paul did not preach the gospel to these people, as they perceive him to be a small g God, after this viper doesn't kill him, he just whips him into the fire. Um, then, he heals, through the power of God, obviously, heals this uh, Publius' father, um, Anyways, heals him. Then all the people bring all the diseased people from the land. And, and Paul, through the power of Christ, heals them. I'm sure Paul preached the gospel to them. And I'm sure a great many of them believed in Jesus. Okay? Put their faith in him. I'm, I'm sure that happened. So look at how God orchestrates this shipwreck to the island of Malta. These people are saved. Now they come to saving faith in Christ Jesus. And now Paul has this relationship with them. He's there for about three months. And then they set sail for Rome. Now, one thing I left out as far as talking about God's sovereign orchestra is how he's orchestrating things. They were also going to try to kill Paul. The soldiers were going to kill Paul, all the prisoners, when they got off the boat. Instead of trying to keep him contained, they were just going to kill all the prisoners. But God also orchestrated that. Read about it. Okay? In chapter 27. Now we're in chapter 28. Paul arrives in Rome and... Um, after three days, this is the first thing he does, right? After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews. Now, why after three days? I don't know. I tend to think that um, Paul is just praying over this time. I don't know. There's no scripture that makes me think that. I just think three days. I bet you Paul was just praying and being with God before whatever's about to happen that he doesn't know, right? <clears throat> All right. After three days, verse 17 of chapter 28. He called together the local leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, 
Yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty, because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Sorry, to appeal to Caesar. Though I had no charge to bring against my nation, for this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. All right, because it's what we have been hoping for, what we've been longing for, what we've been looking for, our Savior, the Messiah, is why I'm wearing these chains, this chain. Verse 21, And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here have reported or spoken any evil about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Okay. Two years back in Jerusalem, the governor Felix kept Paul in prison. Two years later, when they had a new governor, Festus, the Jews were ready, still wanting to kill him, right? Yet, when he goes to Rome, no news of him has made it to Rome at all, right? Kind of wild, okay? So they're like, we don't even know. Verse 23, verse 23. But we're going to come here what you have to say. So verse 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Okay, hear that. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Well, listen to what happens in verse 24. Some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And that's what almost e happens every time Paul preaches the gospel. We see some believed, some didn't. Some hated him, some tried to kill him. Some believed, some didn't. All right. Now listen to how, how he kind of closes this time with all the, this Jew audience, right? And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. And here's a statement. Middle of verse 25. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet. Now he quotes scripture here. Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their eyes they can barely hear, and their ears they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. Verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. So that's almost like salt in the wound. Make sure, I want to make sure that you know that this salvation, God is now sending to the Gentiles, whom they have this, I think, racial, racial struggle with, right? In verse 30, He lived there two whole years, at his own expense, and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. <sighs> Read through this again and unpack it more and, and some time with the Lord in the Word on with yourselves. And look at all, look for all of the moments where man tried to kill Paul, man tried to stifle these things, and demonic oppression was coming against Paul, but God delivered him and God brought him here and then God brought him there and then God used him to speak here and then God spoke through him there. And all the time, Paul says, God was helping him and with him. We're in this time of, of lockdown, coronavirus, and it's no accident, you guys. It is absolutely no accident this is all happening. God's moving in this. God's working in this. And could it be that we are to preach the word to the people around us, that we are to present the gospel to the people around us, that we are to continue to magnify and glorify the name of our God in whatever audience he gives us, whatever that looks like, whether it's a phone call with your buddies, with your friends, with your, co with your cousin. Um, the world is in disarray right now. 
and there's a there's a door that is so easy to open to talk about eternal life to talk about life after death to talk about Jesus to talk about the Bible so my prayer is that we would be sensitive and looking to these moments where we can open up the word and talk about God to the people that don't know him <sighs> I want to read this note in my Bible. That's off of uh, chapter 28, verses 30 through 31. It says, Paul shared the gospel with all, both Jews and Gentiles. This situation continued for two whole years. Other, source, other sources show that Paul was then released and perhaps traveled to Spain. During his imprisonment, Paul wrote the letters to the Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. After Paul's release from his first imprisonment, would be when he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. He probably wrote his last letter, 2 Timothy, during his second imprisonment as he awaited execution. And that's refer that references 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. So we'll probably pick up in 1 Timothy next week. But I, I was doing my Bible study, and this just jumped out at me and how God orchestrated and worked everything for his sovereign plan. Now, another thing that I, I liked to... That jumped out at me as as Paul closes this um, teaching from morning till evening with the Jews, he closes it with probably an insulting thing, right? Nonetheless, it was truth that the Holy Spirit brought to Paul to speak, and it was truth from the Word. It wasn't truth of a feeling or truth of an emotion. It was truth from the Word of God that the Holy Spirit brought up to him to speak in that moment. Now. When we have moments of presenting the word to people, God's going to bring up scripture. But in order for him to bring up scripture, God does what he wants. Okay, He can miraculously bring up scripture to your mind that you've never read. But my point here is that we have to be in the word. We have to be learning, meditating, reading, diving into the word so that God can remind us of it when the time comes. So I pray that you're doing that in this time. Um, it went a little long so I'm sorry it was a bit of a long devotion but I hope God spoke to you guys' heart read these chapters and kind of catch up and we'll have some uh, we'll have some discussion questions for your Zoom tonight watch your emails um, if you're not getting an email watch your parent email and uh, if you don't get any of those reach out to your leaders um, for the Zoom time this evening and um, may you make it a great day through the power of the Holy Spirit all right, I love you guys.